Welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Raya Salter. And I'm Nicole Horry. In our show this week, we'll cover a talk by international journalist Richard Hornick at the China Seminar of the Friends of the East-West Center. The subject was the challenge of Xi Jinping. Can China avoid economic stagnation? An important and provocative topic in the age of Trump. The China Seminar, an educational nonprofit founded by Danny Kwok, is now in its 38th year. It's known for its role as a forum of the Friends of the East-West Center. In his talk, Richard Hornick focused on the notion that all rapidly developing countries eventually face what economists call a middle-income trap when they try to move from resource-driven growth dependent on cheap labor and capital to growth based on high productivity and innovation. Few countries have made that transition, and China's chances have been heavily compromised by the unprecedented growth of private and public sector debt over the past eight years. The question now is whether dynamic Zhongguo will become the muddled kingdom. We need to know. Richard is a lecturer and the director of Overseas Partnership Programs at the Center for News Literacy at the School of Journalism at Stony Brook University. He is a journalist with 30 years of global experience. He was executive editor of Asia Week, deputy chief of correspondence and news service director of Time in New York, and served as Times bureau chief in Warsaw, Boston, Beijing, and Hong Kong, and as national economics correspondent in Washington, D.C., and Europe business editor in London. Richard co-authored Massacre in Beijing, China's Struggle for Democracy with Donald Morrison and has written for Foreign Affairs, Fortune, Smithsonian, The New York Times, and The Wall Street Journal. He has an MA in Russian Studies from George Washington University and a BA in Political Science from Brown University. He is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and has been a journalist in residence at the East-West Center. He was the visiting lecturer at the University of Hong Kong in 2012 and at UH Manoa in 2015. Richard is also an editorial consultant who has designed and implemented editorial reorganizations at Reuters and the Harvard Business Review. In 2011, he served as the Harvard Business Review's interim editor. With all that in mind, let's take a look at some of the remarks he made at January's China seminar. Can China move from being an upper middle income country to an upper income country. And that challenge, so a middle income country by the World Bank's definition is one where the gross national income, which is a measure of, of economic activity, is roughly 12 to, a, a maximum of 12 or $13,000 per capita. <coughs> and the challenge uh, is that it's very, very difficult to move from what they call a resource-driven economy, one that relies heavily on lots of labor, lots of capital, um, to one that more uh, is based on innovation and, economic, and high productivity. So if you, you know, ask somebody from the World Bank, they'll tell you that you know, the, the way you have to do it is you we try to get authentic innovation that is innovation that's actually creating something new and not just a, an incremental change or improvement um, and not something that's been copied from someone else. Um, requires new processes and new markets and uh, it, one of the key elements is to get domestic demand up enough so that your country is not reliant on exports. Most of the countries that have gone, economies that have grown over the last 20 or 30 or 40 years have been driven by, have had export-led growth, at some point you have to then rely on your own economy. The requirements are pretty straightforward. You have to invest in education and infrastructure. If you're going to raise productivity, you have to have a better educated workforce. Um, you have to be able to move products and goods. Uh, you need a, an atmosphere that's conducive to innovation. That is, you need people who are willing to take risks, people who will try crazy things, people who will think outside of the box. And because most uh, rapidly industrialized countries have built up large in, uh, debts, you have to figure out ways to pay those off. So I think we all know the Asian success stories, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong. 
This actually provides you with a very misleading view of what it takes to get out of the middle income zone. Because although there are those success stories, there are many, many more failures. The blue, the blue countries are the ones who have gotten out of the middle income classification. All the others are stuck or on the verge of getting out. Um, and by the way, uh, as it, it says there, all but one of the infamous or famous BRICS is still a middle income country. Only Russia is, uh, has gotten out, and that's purely based on its uh, raw materials, its resources. It's not, it's a, uh, as is Saudi Arabia. China is facing uh, a ticking clock, if you will. As you can see, you know, it was one of the great growth stories of, of, uh, of the 20th century. And in the 21st century, beginning in 2008, it's had a, a very, very rapid drop-off from 15% annual growth down to 65 And most people who follow these things uh, don't actually believe any of those figures. Uh, sorry. Um, but they're, they're rough approximations, and they, so they're, 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 they're measures within broad bands. Regardless of what you think the actual number is, everybody agrees that it's a lot less than it used to be. Now, part of the reason for that, and this is another problem with being a, a middle-income country as you're trying to get bigger, is something called the law of large numbers. So if you have $100, and you want to, and you increase that, you know, by ten dollars. That's a ten percent increase. But if you've got a thousand dollars, and you increase it by ten dollars, that's a one percent increase. As your economy gets bigger, it gets harder to get those high percentages. And China has been facing this problem for quite a while. It's um, as somebody who's covered it for a long time and, and often been called a China skeptic. Um, I've, I've always enjoyed the sort of straight line projections that the China optimists like to use. Well, if it continues growing at 15% a year for the next 20, well, it's not going to continue growing. It's not going to grow at 10. It's not, you know, it, it can't. The law of large numbers says it can. China's drive for indigenous innovation, uh, we could have a whole separate uh, talk about that. Um, we'll, we'll skip over it right now. But China, uh, I think about 10 years ago, uh, no, seven years ago, launched an indigenous innovation uh, effort. Um, and <coughs> these were the, the industries that China decided they were going to invest in to make that happen. Well, I anybody who's ever covered economics knows there's this expression about picking winners. And is it possible for, for bureaucrats to actually pick future industries? And although Meaty is always held up as the great example of that in Japan, eventually Meaty's luck ran out. Um, and in fact, Meaty had quite a few misfires. I don't know if any of you know this, but uh, Meaty did not want Sony to uh, import a line to make transistors back in the early 50s. Um, they didn't want Honda to make cars. Um, so when you have bureaucrats deciding what are going to be the industries of the future, you know, they'll be right and they'll be wrong. It's, you know, our economy is based on the belief that it should be done by the market. Okay, so China's specific challenges. First of all, they have to build human capital because growth, uh, the, the demographics, the one-child policy has meant that they have this ticking uh, time bomb of of uh, people who are going to be, well, the, 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 there are just not as many young people. They've just gotten rid of the two-child policy, uh, one-child policy, but that won't have any impact for 15 to 20 years. Um, restructuring state-owned enterprises. This is perhaps the most obvious uh, issue. It's the one that has been talked about probably more than any other by their public officials, and it's the one where, unfortunately, uh, in the last five years, the least uh, progress has been made, uh, and in fact, they probably went backwards. And then <coughs> reducing public and private leverage uh, while maintaining healthy economic growth. And that is, um, that's, the, that's the dilemma. Cutting the debt, but keeping the economy going. And you've got a, an economy that's very, very dependent on debt. So on human capital, um, this is from the OECD. These are just some ideas of 
things that they should be doing. China has been increasing its, its spending on basic education, um, but it still uh, ranks 109th in the world in terms of uh, percent of GDP. So uh, evaluate university and university staff more on the quality of academic output. Um, anybody who heard my talk last year about academic freedom in China knows uh, what's going on there. And uh, promote research autonomy, merit-based promotion, and stronger intellectual property rights. And again, these are all things that are great on paper, but are very, very difficult to get to in practice. Because, I'm oh, sorry, because um, again, this idea of being able to pick winners, China is investing a lot of money in R&D, but it's almost all going through government agencies. And the, the process of applying for these uh, uh, funds is, is, is highly, highly political. <coughs> so the state-owned enterprise issue is, uh, again, uh, it's a dilemma. And it's unfortunately one that I think has gotten worse in the last five or six years. Um, so you can see from this chart. The orange is the percent of total industrial assets in the country, which have gone down considerably. But the percent of total urban employment has gone down even more. So basically, state-owned enterprises are eating up a huge amount of China's assets and, and employing very, very few people. But the people they do employ are important. They're like auto workers in Detroit. Um, these are people who um, China is quite afraid of, of, of them becoming disaffected by making them, uh, taking their jobs away. So, uh, and this uh, share of profits, uh, private companies skyrocketing, uh, state controlled companies dropping like a stone. Assets for state enterprises versus private enterprises, 2.8% versus 10.6%. Uh, all of you who have funds to invest, tell me where you would put your money. Unfortunately, where do you think all the money is going right now? It's going to the 2.8%. It's going to the state-owned enterprises because they are so heavily in debt that the government has to keep propping them up because they don't want them to go bankrupt because they don't want to put all those people out on the street. This is not something that's new, by the way. J uh, Japan went through a very similar thing in the 80s and 90s. This is not special to China. Every, every middle-income country that's gone through this has gone through some uh, elements of this. Uh, yeah, and state, as I was saying, state-owned enterprises have twice the, uh, the debt as private companies. That's the debt-to-asset ratio is 60% uh, for the state-owned enterprises, and it's uh, somewhere under 50-something percent for, for private. So, therefore, China's debt is growing. Um, you will see in the next couple of charts that 2008 is a very important date. Look at the, look at the bend of the curve to 2007. They were, they were getting debt under control. In 2008, what happened in 2008? The financial crisis. And the financial crisis hit China in, a, in an indirect but very important way because it reduced the, the demand for their uh, exports. And so the government needed to generate economic activity. And they did it largely by investing in infrastructure. Uh, household debt has never been a problem in China. Um, they, they, people buy their apartments or have bought their apartments for cash uh, up until recently. But again, in the last few years, they've uh, more and more have been allowed to mortgage. And household debt is beginning to climb, which depresses demand uh, for domestically made goods. But the real time bomb in China and the debt is, is the local government uh, debt, which has been growing by leaps and bounds and which is being hidden in any number of ways. Um, uh, it's, it's, um, again, it's, it's, trust me, it's, it's not good. Um, and this is one of the ways it's been hidden. Uh, there's this thing called shadow banking. So these are assets that are not directly on the books of state-owned banks. Um, they're on finance companies, uh, broker asset management, uh, some the trust loans. There's a whole thing called a wealth management product in China. The Chinese banking system in the last five years has doubled in its size. It has effectively added the United States banking system to its size because it is now twice 
the size of the American economy, uh, the American banking system, even though the American economy is still about 80% larger than the Chinese economy. So we do pretty well with a banking system that's got about 15, 17 trillion dollars in it. The Chinese banking system has 35 trillion dollars in it. So everybody's well, but they've got the four trillion dollars that uh, w you know they loaned us, uh, you know, to 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 cover all of this, right? So they're, oh wait, so in the last two years, they've lost a trillion dollars of that of their foreign exchange reserves. There are a bunch of reasons why the reserves are are declining. Uh, the biggest one uh, is is probably the, the 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 decline of the of the renminbi, which is uh, it is, actually this is one of the ironies. I, I said I wasn't going to talk about uh, uh, Mr. Trump, but um, he, he is he is right. The Chinese are manipulating their currency; they're keeping it from falling even faster. It should be it should be easily over seven to the dollar, but again. They're not going to let that happen, at least for a while. And, well, the reason is capital flight. Um, so if you're running a country that has a, a fairly closed financial system, but you allow people to get money out, and it turns out that the assets seem to be depreciating, they are going to get the money out. And the Chinese have proved incredibly creative in getting money out. Mostly it's done by double invoicing, uh, but um, one of my favorite anecdotes was being in Hong Kong a couple of years ago, maybe you saw this as well, there are these Gucci stores in Causeway Bay, and you go into, a, into that store with a Chinese credit card that bills you in renminbi, you buy it, a Gucci bag for $1,000, you take it next door to a shop that will give you $700 in cash. The other weird thing about uh, capital flight is that the more you try to stop it, the more people are going to be convinced that they better get the hell out today. Um, and so in the last couple of weeks, months, they've announced a whole bunch of new efforts to, uh, they call it throwing sand in the gears, just to slow things down. Uh, apparently, Western companies now are finding it difficult to get some, repatriate some of their profits. Uh, bankers in China have been told that they are not allowed to tell people that their uh, you know, request to move money has been disallowed because of a government policy. It's, they have to make up some other reason. Um, increased reporting. So you, as a private citizen, you can take $50,000 a year out. Um, <coughs> so everybody is expecting it all to go out in the next you know, month or so. Um, but they're, they're, they're going to have increased reporting requirements. Uh, anyway, they're, they're trying very hard, but it's not going to stop it. So <coughs> time to panic. Um, no, I, you know, I, I think that, um, and I've made a few of them myself, predictions of China's uh, economic de demise are, are greatly exaggerated. I, I, I should have started my talk by reminding you all uh, of, of my, uh, my w uh, very uh, often referenced uh, piece in Foreign Affairs in 1994 when I was in, at the East-West Center entitled uh, Bursting China's Bubble in which I predicted the demise of the Chinese financial system because of a whole bunch of these same problems. So why am I always wrong? Why, and why, why don't I think something bad's going to happen now? Because I've learned my lesson. They know how to reflate. You know? they'll, they'll, they will not, the, the economy is not going to come to a screeching halt. They won't let it. They're gonna, the, the taps are going to stay open. And they're going to try on the edges to try to, to change things. But it's, they're going to keep the economy going. And especially with Xi Jinping coming up for, uh, as it were, re-election uh, later this year, perhaps even getting himself a third term or laying the groundwork for a third term, they're not going to, to run any risks. So the debt will, be, will continue to grow. But because of that, uh, this was in 2015. Uh, Finance Minister Lu, Wei, Lu Jiwei said that China has a greater than 50-50 chance, 50% 50 chance of falling into the middle income trap in the next five to ten years. And I think if you asked him today, he might say that that, tro that, 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 that that chance is even greater. And this is the only chart you need to remember from this whole talk. 
This is, if you look again, look at 2008, and then the, the, that, right. The way economies work is you, you know, we, we, put, we print money, we loan money, then there is a multiplier effect. It creates a certain amount of economic activity. In the good old days, even, you know, for less than a dollar, you got more than a dollar's worth of economic activity. Today, it takes eight dollars to get you one point of GDP growth. So, it, and this, again, not the first time. This is what happened to Japan in the, you know, the lost decade. This is a, you know, they kept building all these bridges to nowhere and the bullet trains and all this other stuff. Eventually, you run out of impact from loans. So the loans simply serve to keep things ticking over. And in that case, you're not going to have this progress. So is this, you know, horrible? Well, no. China's got, you know, have, will have a uh, gross national income of 15 to maybe $20,000 over the next some years. I've, you know, it's, but the idea that somehow it's going to make that leap that economists think are, is important to a, 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 a wealthy economy, not a middle income economy, I think is, uh, I, you know, I think I'll be right about that one anyway. Thank you. Are increasing levels and proportions of debt a fatal flaw in the growth of China's remarkable economy? The rise of China has been of increasing interest and concern over the past 15 or 20 years. But now, in the heat of the isolation and contention created by the Trump administration, it becomes all the more important for us to understand and follow what's going on. ThinkTech, from its inception, has followed China on a regular basis with extended coverage of talks by journalists like Richard Hornick, and we'll, of course, continue to do so. So stay tuned for more. Want to know more about Richard Hornick? Google him and check out his link at Stony Brook. Want to know more about the China Seminar? Check it out at the Friends of the East-West Center. And now let's take a look at our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. There's so much happening in Hawaii. Sometimes things happen under the radar and we don't hear much about them. But ThinkTech will take you there. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on OC16 several times every week to stay current on what's happening in government, industry, academia, and communities around the islands and the world. ThinkTech broadcasts its daily talk shows live on the internet from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays. Then we broadcast our earlier shows all night long and on the weekends. If you missed a show, or if you want to replay or share our shows, they're all archived on demand on thinktechhawaii.com and YouTube. The audio is on thinktechhawaii.com slash radio. And we are now posting podcasts of all our shows on iTunes. See our website for links. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and live stream and YouTube links. Or sign up on our email list and get the daily docket of our upcoming shows. ThinkTech has a high-tech, green-screen, First Amendment studio at Pioneer Plaza. If you want to join our live audience or participate in our shows, write to think at thinktechhawaii.com. Give us a thumbs up on YouTube or send us a tweet at thinktechhi. We'd like to know how you feel about the issues and events that affect our lives together in these islands. We want to stay in touch with you, and we'd like you to stay in touch with us. Let's think together. <laughs>
And yes, you can call in to our talk shows live. While you're watching any of our shows, you can call in to 415-871-2474 and pose a question or participate in the discussion. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of ThinkTech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Okay, Nicole, that wraps up this week's edition of ThinkTech. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Nicole does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more ThinkTech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech, visit ThinkTechHawaii.com. Be a guest or a host, a producer or an intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks so much for being part of our ThinkTech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and global awareness in Hawaii. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. I'm Raya Salter. And I'm Nicole Horry. Aloha, everyone. <laughs>